glory to us now. And uh, if we saw Christ, and if at the end of this time together, each one of us could say that Christ is Lord, wouldn't that be good? So um, we'll, we'll ask God to help us. Let's pray. And then we'll look into his word together. Father, we uh, thank you that we uh, are able now to gather and to consider the things that you've told us. Uh, we thank you that in your word we see your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and that all your glory is displayed in him. And uh, we just pray now, help us then to see your glory uh, and to rejoice in you. Uh, and we ask that each one of us would know uh, and be able to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to your glory. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we're in Hebrews chapter 10, if you want to turn there with me. And uh, Hebrews chapter 10 is a great tonic. Uh, to anyone who uh, feels their faith is wavering, feels they are worried or concerned and could be knocked off course. Uh, it's a great uh, tonic and a help uh, to any who feel that way. We're going to look especially at verses 19 to 25. I'll read those again. Uh, Hebrews 10 verses 19 to 25. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place, by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain, that is his body. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another, and all the more, as you see the day approaching. Uh, the book of Hebrews is uh, written uh, to a group of Christians who are about to give up. Uh, they feel like uh, their old life, their life before Christ, has more to offer than life in Christ. And so they're on the verge of giving up. OK, they're unsure. Uh, they're lacking in confidence. And they just feel like their previous life was more worth it. <clears throat> they're on the verge of giving up. Uh, Christians, perhaps, who, who are drifting away from the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, it's very applicable to people like that. Christians who who've taken their eyes away from Jesus and they're thinking, do you know what? Life without him just seems so much better, so much freer. Uh, it seems like it's not worth carrying on. Uh, but I think it also would apply um, to those who are involved in church life. Perhaps that's some of you. You, you come along, you hear preaching every week and uh, you're on the fringes of church life, but you just don't know whether you can commit to Jesus Christ. And uh, I think it's applicable to people like you as well. Uh, who feel like you're on the fringes and you could just drift off. Well, whatever type of person you are, if you're at risk of uh, wandering away from the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, if you're weighing up whether it's worth it to carry on as a Christian or to commit to being a Christian at all, uh, well, this letter might be very helpful to you. Uh, that's the type of people that this letter was written to. And uh, that problem then is addressed uh, in one way. It's addressed by teaching people about Jesus. And then by taking that truth about Jesus and showing what a difference it makes in our lives. Uh, it's a teaching about Jesus and that teaching being applied. And all the way through the letter, those two things are, are weaved together. Uh, but especially in chapter 10, verse 19, where we are starting to look at, there's a big turning point in this letter. Uh, where before that, the bulk of it has been pure teaching about the Lord Jesus. And from now on, the bulk of it is going to be, what does that mean in your life? So we've got a real turning point here. It's 10 verse 19. Uh, and so here we're going to see uh, the Lord Jesus Christ presented to us and the truth about Jesus applied to us as the only help for anyone who's thinking about drifting away from Jesus. If you're thinking of giving up on him, thinking of wandering from him or thinking he's not worth following at all, uh, the thing you've got to do now is look at Jesus. Think about Jesus and think about what a difference uh, he makes. Uh, if you're, you're lacking confidence, 
uh, in the Lord Jesus Christ. It might be because of a failure to, to see and to understand the strength of your stance in Jesus. It may be uh, that you're failing to lean on Jesus, perhaps because you're leaning elsewhere. Other things seem more appealing. Uh, well, the answer to all that, to anyone who lacks confidence, uh, to anyone who's, who's struggling to keep going, the answer is to consider Jesus. And to consider all that belongs to you in Jesus. And to think about the, the difference that could make. Uh, so what we're going to do is we, we look at this section, chapter 10, verses 19 to 25. Uh, we're going to see some of those things. What is true about Jesus and true about us in Jesus? And then what difference does that make for us? Now, there's actually three of each in this passage. Um, I don't normally fall into three-point sermons, but as it happens, there's two three-point sermons in here. There's three of each of those things, right? And you can see them as you, as you read through it. Uh, in some of your um, Bibles, you might see... Uh, it designated by particular words, okay? There's things that we have in Jesus, and then there's things we must do as a result. You might see it um, designated by words like uh, we have or having, okay? There's three things like that we're going to look at, and then you'll see the words let us. That's what we've got to do as a result. So what do we have in Jesus, uh, and what then must we do as a result? Well, the first thing I want us to consider is not the first one that's listed here, but the first one that we're going to consider is this. Uh, in verse 21, uh, we have a high priest. We have a high priest. Uh, now, to explain what the high priest does, and uh, some of you might have drifted off as we read Leviticus 16. I've got to be honest, I think Leviticus 16 is the best thing I've ever read. Uh, it tells us how our sins are dealt with. It's incredible. Well, in Leviticus 16, we saw the role of the high priest. And uh, to explain the role of the high priest, perhaps we could uh, talk about it in terms of uh, a no entry sign. Uh, now, there's some places in the world that are marked off with a no entry sign. They say you can't come in. Uh, there might be places where you work and there's a big sign on the door. It says no entry. And certain people are not allowed in. You don't have the authority. Uh, maybe there's other places you've seen it. Perhaps uh, as you drive down the road, uh, you'll go around a roundabout and on one turn in, you'll see a big sign that says no entry. Uh, there's some places you just can't go. You're not authorised to go in there. And if you do, there could be consequences. OK, if you walk through a, a no entry sign on a door in work, you could get in serious trouble. Uh, if you go through a no entry sign on a motorway, you've got more immediate trouble. Uh, the fact is, if there's a no entry sign, it tells you you can't go in. Uh, well, if you like, the ultimate no entry sign was found in the Old Testament uh, over the place where God lived, where God dwelt among his people. Uh, over that place, the tabernacle where God was found, there was a big sign that said no entry, don't come in. Uh, the place where God dwelt among his people. It was called the most holy place. And the fact is, people like you and me who are not holy, we couldn't get in there. Uh, the place where God dwelt was in a tent called the tabernacle, big tent. And if you were to walk towards that tent, uh, you'd have been confronted with a big curtain, which acted like a door. And so immediately you've got something blocking you out. Uh, now, you and I wouldn't have been able just to wander in as we saw fit. But if you did go in, you'd have seen a few things. Uh, if you'd gone through this curtain, you'd have gone into a place called the holy place. And in the holy place, you'd have found all sorts of weird and wonderful things. Strange furniture, mainly. Uh, places where animals were sacrificed. Uh, places where incense was burned. All sorts of strange things around you. Uh, and as you walk past all that strange furniture, uh, you would have come then to another curtain, another door. Uh, this time it had more things embroidered into it. It was more impressive. Uh, and that door blocked off a place called the most holy place. And that door worked as a no entry sign. It said under no conditions can you cross this boundary. Do not come in because God is there. Uh, no entry. 
that Aaron's sons, we read about that at the start of Leviticus 16. If you want to know more of that story, read earlier in the book. Uh, Aaron's sons, two of them, they tried to go in on their own terms and they got burnt to death. This is serious stuff. God is holy. Uh, well, in fact, um, there is only one person who could go into the most holy place. Uh, that person was called the high priest. The high priest could go through that door once a year. But when he went in, um, the most holy place, that was meant to be filled with smoke. So he couldn't see the stuff that was in there. And when he went in, he had to carry a bowl of blood in front of him uh, to prove that something had died in his place. He had to carry that in front of him. And when he went in, he could only go in once a year on the, on the Day of Atonement. And uh, he could only be in there for the bare minimum time. Didn't mess about. And so the people, their only chance of entering into the dwelling place of God, into this most holy place, was if a representative, a high priest, one of them would enter in on their behalf. Having been invited by God, he couldn't go on his own terms. And if he went in, they were represented in there through him. Uh, you see, you can only come before God on God's terms. Aaron's sons found that out the hard way. You can only come before God on God's terms. It'd be foolish to try any other way. Uh, so I wonder, what other ways have you tried? What have you tried to get near to God? Or to uh, satisfy your life? Or to get to some ultimate experience? What have you tried to get to God? Do you know, we'd be terribly foolish to try any other way. Uh, God has given us a way that we can come before him. He's been uh, very kind to us to do that. Uh, God didn't have to give us any way. Uh, but God has provided one way for us to come before him. And uh, we'd be foolish to try any other way. Uh, the designated way, the one way that God has made, is to enter in by being made holy. You see, that high priest could go in, but he had to go through all sorts of preparations before he could. Uh, he couldn't just wander in any old house. He had to go in and he had to be made holy. Uh, the only way for you and me to come before God is if we're made holy. Uh, the problem is we're not. Uh, we are not holy. And so to us, there stands, if you like, this big no entry sign before the dwelling place of God. You and I, we can't go in. And that's a problem to us. It's a problem particularly because one day you and I are going to meet God and we're going to stand before him and we're not going to be ready because you can only stand before God if you're holy. He said that you can't come any other way. But one day we're going to stand before him. Uh, what uh, a reason we have then to be so terrified. Uh, God has made it clear to us we, we can't come before him. Uh, but we're going to try anyway. Uh, well, what a comfort then this, this, this first thing that we have is. Uh, we have a high priest. We have a high priest. Uh, we have one who is, who is like us. Uh, but one who can atone for our sin. And one who can bring us to God. We have a high priest. Uh, let me ask you then at, at that point. Um, if, we, if God has provided a high priest for us so that we can come before God, um, why would you rely on anything else? Uh, God has invited you to come to him through the great high priest he's given, through the Lord Jesus Christ. God has invited you to come to him through him. Uh, why would you try any other way? We have a high priest. We have a way to come to God through the Lord Jesus Christ. And because of that, the, the second thing we're told that we have, verse 19 this time, uh, we have boldness to enter. We have confidence to come before God because of the work of this high priest. Uh, you see, this high priest, uh, he's unique. Uh, his priesthood is a new priesthood. It's a, a better priesthood. Uh, it's, it's unique in, in a number of ways. We'll think of just two of them. Um, 
this high priest's priesthood is unique, first of all, in that the offering that he brings is unique. And thank God for that. You see, we read in, in Hebrews 10, uh, the blood of bulls and goats can't take away your sin. Can't do it. But this high priest, he brings a, a new offering, a better offering. One that can actually work. One that can deal with your sin. You see, the, on the Day of Atonement, um, the high priest, he took a number of offerings in with him. Uh, the first thing he had to do was he had to take a, a bull and a ram, and they would be to atone for his own sin. He'd take the, uh, the ram and he'd burn it to smithereens. And that showed that God's anger had been poured out on something instead of him. And then he'd take the bull and he'd kill the bull and drain its blood. And he'd take that blood into the holy place with him. And as he took it in, he'd sprinkle it before him. And that blood would serve as proof that something had died for that priest's sins. That he wouldn't die for his sin because something had died in his place. And then he'd take in uh, uh, more offerings. He then go to take two goats and a ram. Again, the ram would be taken and burned, this time for the sins of the people. Uh, but he'd also take two goats. Uh, the first goat would have uh, the priest's hands laid on it. And all the sins of the people would be confessed over it. And it would be as if that ram was, was bearing the people's sins. And then that ram would be taken off and, and sent into the wilderness. They'd never come back. God would take their sins and send them away forever. Uh, but the other ram, uh, the other goat, sorry, uh, that then would have its blood shed. That would be killed. And again, the high priest would, would come in and he'd offer this time the blood of the, the goat. And that blood would serve as proof that something had died for the people's sins. That they didn't have to die when they came before God. Uh, this high priest, he comes in and he's done all sorts of other stuff. But among them, he comes in with two bowls of blood. He brings blood for his own sins. And he brings blood for the sins of the people. You see, blood has got to be shed. Life must be given for sin against God. That's what sin costs. That's the price of sin. Blood has got to be shed. God is a holy God, a just God. He does everything right. And so sin has got to be punished. And the price for sin is blood. And so the priest, he went in and he took these two bowls of blood, one for his own sins, one for the sins of the people. Uh, but we're told that our high priest, his offering is different. It's unique. Um, this high priest, he brings only one bowl of blood. He brings no blood for his own sins. Well, you might think, uh, how presumptuous of it. How dare he come before God without blood for his own sin? We've seen already no one can come before God unless their sin is atoned for, unless they're holy. Surely this high priest, if he comes in with just one bowl of blood, our great high priest, surely he'll be struck down. This high priest, he offers only one bowl of blood, should be struck down, but, but he is a living priest. He provides a, a new and a living way for us to get to God. You see, no blood is needed for a sinless priest. A sinless priest needs to offer no blood for his own sin. There isn't any. And that's the, the high priest you and I have. We have a high priest who gives us boldness to enter by this new and living way that he offers. He comes in, you see, uh, offering only one bowl of blood. And that blood that he offers is his own. He comes in to the presence of God 
offering sinless blood, perfect blood, blood that can really deal with sin. He comes uh, as one who can really stand in the place of sinners. Uh, the blood of one who hadn't sinned and so he didn't need to die. He comes and he offers his own blood to God. And so, perhaps you sing this sometimes. Um, because the sinless saviour died, my sinful soul is counted free. Because God the just is satisfied when he looks on him, the perfect, holy, spotless priest with no sin of his own, who comes in offering his own blood. He looks on him and he's willing then to pardon you and me. God is pleased to forgive our sin because our great high priest goes in needing no atonement of his own and offers his own blood uh, for our sins. His offering is unique, uh, but also his intercession is unique. The work that he does for us is unique. You see, not only does this high priest enter on our behalf, uh, but he also calls us in there with him. You see, when the high priest went in in the Old Testament, when he went into the, the dwelling place of God, one of the rules was no one was meant to go in there with him. Everyone else is meant to stay out until he's done what he's got to do. But this priest, he goes in and he calls us in there too. Do you realize no other priest ever did this? No other high priest could ever do this. No, he goes in and he calls us in with him. And as this high priest hung upon Calvary's cross and died for our sins, as his flesh was torn there on the cross, well, at that time, um, there was a, a veil, a curtain, a no entry sign in the temple. And as his flesh was torn on the cross and then as his sinless blood was shed, that curtain was torn open. Do you see what's happening there? The priest doesn't only go in on our behalf and then come back out only to have to go in next year and offer the same sins, repeat the same sacrifices repeatedly for sins. Now, this priest, he goes in and he goes in forever. And once he's gone in, he rips the curtain down and calls all of us to come in with him. All of us who trust in him. He kicks over the no entry sign. He says, if you like, come in, come in. The work that he does is unique. And so you and I, Christian, uh, like priests, we are to come to God on the grounds of the blood that was shed uh, from the Lord Jesus Christ. The blood of Christ offered once for all for the forgiveness of sins. So surely, uh, if he's done that work for us, we're to enter boldly. We're to come with confidence. Because he's given us the right to do so. God has always said, stay away from my dwelling place. You can't come in. But because of what Jesus Christ has done, the right has been given to us to enter into God's dwelling place. Listen, Christian, uh, don't wallow in self-pity. And don't lack confidence before God. Uh, Jesus Christ himself, he is the grounds of your confidence. You might have had a shocking week. You might not live up to the standards of other people on these screens. But listen now, Jesus Christ is the grounds of your confidence. If you're trusting in him, come boldly. Don't stay away from him. Come to him. Come before almighty God and plead the blood of Jesus Christ. Come with confidence. Accept then all the blessing of God. Call upon him, uh, plead with him for yourself and for your loved ones and uh, for those who don't know him. Intercede on their behalf. Come before God uh, with confidence because he's invited you in, in the Lord Jesus Christ. A way has been made. He's called you in through it. Um, we have a high priest. Through that high priest, we have boldness to enter the holy place. 
And then in verse 22, um, we have cleansing from sin because of the work that he does. Our hearts, we're told, are sprinkled clean. That is, your, your conscience can be eased. Your mind can be put at rest. Because you know uh, the power of the sin-cleansing blood of the Lord Jesus Christ being applied to yourself. That is, this priest, when he goes in and does this work, he does it properly. He does a good job. He actually sorts your sin out for you. And because he does a good job, that work is meant to have an effect in your life. I wonder, do you know that you are forgiven in the Lord Jesus Christ? Do you know? Listen, if, if you've got a troubled conscience and you're a Christian, um, address your troubled conscience with this. Uh, Jesus Christ died and rose for you. Uh, he has declared you to be holy in God's sight. He has welcomed you to come before him. He has given you the right to enter, not into uh, any place, but into the holiest place of all. And there's nothing that you or me or anyone else uh, could ever say or do that could overrule what he has said. Uh, he is the grounds of your confidence. Christian, address your troubled conscience with these truths. Jesus Christ has done all that needs to be done to deal with your sin. Our hearts are sprinkled clean and our, our bodies are washed. Uh, like the Old Testament uh, priests, uh, we're cleansed and we're made fit for service. Uh, this could mean uh, perhaps that the practical outworking of the Christian life, uh, it may even be a reference to baptism, bodies washed. Uh, it's not that clear. Um, if it's baptism, then we know, don't we? Baptism doesn't, doesn't make us believers. It doesn't actually wash our sin away in itself. Uh, but at baptism, uh, you ought to have been uh, professing faith in Christ. And it is that faith that you professed when you came to him. That is the faith that you continue in. Uh, and that faith then is the, the grounds of your confidence. Uh, by faith in Christ, you were made clean. Do you believe it? Do you believe it? We have a high priest. We have boldness to enter the holiest place. We have cleansing from sin. And so uh, briefly, there's a, there's a few things we must then do. How does this work out in our lives? First of all, uh, again, in verse 22, therefore, let us draw near to God. Uh, because we have a high priest, who has successfully entered into the presence of God, and because he has allowed us to enter there as well, uh, because he's cleansed us, because he's made us ready to enter and to serve the Lord, uh, well, let's go in. Let us draw near. A man called A.W. Pink uh, wrote about this. He said, uh, because of all these things that uh, Christ has done, uh, not only do we have nothing to hinder us, but we now have every reason to draw near. Because of all that Christ has done, not only do we have nothing to hinder us, we now have every reason to draw near. So Christian, come close. Hold nothing back. Come before your God. Bring everything to him. Come and delight in his presence. Come and enjoy being with him. Because he's called you in and he's made you ready to come before him. Let us draw near. And then having drawn near, uh, let us hold fast. Let us hold on. Uh, we hold on to him um, because he is, is holding on to us. We're told that there. Uh, let us hold fast the confession of our faith because he who promised is faithful. Uh, again, um, Pink says this. Uh, God has made great and precious promises to believers, and he is a faithful God, true to his word. There is no falseness or fickleness with him, and there should be none with us. His faithfulness should excite and encourage us to be faithful, 
and we must depend more upon his promises to us than upon our promises to him. And we must plead with him the promise of grace sufficient. The question really for us is, um, if Jesus Christ is this faithful to us, why on earth would we stray from him? Why would we go away from him? No, because he is all this to us. Our high priest who's done this great work and dealt with our sin. Hold fast to him. Hold fast to him. You'll never be let down. Your sin will never be brought back up against you. You'll uh, never stop being to you all that you truly need him to be as your saviour. Uh, hold fast to him. Uh, let us draw near. Now, once we're in, let us hold fast. Essentially, God's message here to us is because of all I've done for you, just come here and don't let go. Come here and don't let go. And then finally, the, the third thing that we are to do as a result uh, is to consider one another. Let us consider one another so that we can stir one, one another up to love and good works. Um, the people of God grow in confidence in Christ uh, when we encourage each other to look to him. As how the Christian life is to be lived. We are to encourage each other to look to Christ. And there's a verse in, in here that's quite difficult at the moment. It says, not forsaking the assembly of yourselves together, as is the habit of some. Do you know, well, that's, that's pretty hard at the moment because uh, we're stuck in our homes most of the time. Um, the fact is there are legitimate reasons at the moment why people may not gather. Um, but although that is the case, um, there are still ways at the moment of encouraging one another and pointing one another to Christ. And the principle is true that if we aren't hindered from uh, worshipping God together, then we're to do it. And as we do it, perhaps the way that we're to do it is we're to remind each other of what we have in Christ. Uh, what those things are that are true of him and of us. And how they uh, make a difference to us. To remind each other we have a high priest. One who has dealt with our sin, one who pleads our cause. It's not right for the Christian life to be lived in isolation. Uh, it ought to be, be a delight for us to gather together around the word uh, and to hear what our high priest has done for us. I wonder, th this time of, of hindrances on church life where we haven't been able to gather normally, um, what effect has that had on you? Was it, has it made you more eager to gather together? Or has it made you more complacent and quite happy to sit at home? I don't know what effect it might have had on you. Uh, but surely it's a delight uh, to gather together and to point one another to the Lord Jesus Christ uh, and to gather around his word. Uh, you see, on the Day of Atonement, um, all Israel gathered around that tent and they couldn't get in but they waited eagerly for the high priest to come back out because they wanted to know that he'd done his work and he'd done it properly they desperately wanted to know that their sins were forgiven here's the principle for us are we that desperate to hear of jesus christ and to know of the work that he's done for us to know that our sins are forgiven for his sake. Do we share in that anticipation? Do you know, we're so blessed in the Lord Jesus Christ. We've got so much. Such a privilege to, to be a Christian. Uh, so because of all that is ours in him, because we have a high priest, because uh, we have boldness to come before him, because we have cleansing from sin, uh, let us then all together draw near to God. And once we've come near to God, uh, let us never let him go. Come to him and hold on forever. Let's pray together and I'll hand back over. Uh, we thank you, Heavenly Father, for such a great high priest in the Lord Jesus Christ. And we thank you for all his work on our behalf. And we thank you that we can be fully forgiven of sin through him. And Lord, we uh, do struggle 
uh, to fix our attention on him. And uh, perhaps these past uh, few months, this past year has been particularly difficult. And uh, so, Lord, we pray, um, help us now uh, to think high thoughts of him and uh, to be encouraged to walk closely with him. But we do pray that soon, uh, as churches, we would be able to gather more normally and uh, that we would be able to uh, praise you as we should. And uh, Lord, we pray that until that time, uh, you'd keep us and grow in us an eagerness to know of the work that you've done. Uh, Lord, help us now to take confidence in you and to rejoice in your work for us, for Jesus' sake. Amen.